All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom event. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. So we're really excited for today's event. Uh, we are going to talk a little penguin action today. So I want to give a shout out to the, question, the classrooms who are starting to join us from across North America, classrooms in Canada and the United States via YouTube, as well as on camera live with us today. We're excited to get to know you a little bit better and take some of your questions, but we're really excited today to be joined by uh, Pablo Borboro Oglu. He is the founder and president of the Global Penguin Society, an international science-based conservation coalition that protects the world's penguin species. He's also the founder and co-chair of the IUCN SSC Penguin Specialist Group, a researcher at the National Research Council in Argentina, and an affiliate professor at the University of Washington. So since 1989, he has worked in the field of marine conservation and leads a global conservation effort to benefit penguins in several countries at different scales. So this includes the creating of large marine protected areas uh, on land and in the ocean to improve penguin colony uh, management. So Pablo, let me pop your microphone on. It's so great to have you joining us today. How are you doing? Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, well, at least good morning here in South America. Thank you so much for, uh, to you, Joe, and thank you to National Geographic and all the, all the people that are joining us this, this day. Uh, and thank you for everybody that is interested in, in penguin conservation and penguin research. So um, right now um, we are trying to, to change the computer, <laughs> but um, we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> So um, to, to get started, uh, as Joe mentioned, I am from Argentina. I am right now in the, in a, in the south of Argentina, which is the, the south part of South America. Uh, I live in a province called Chubut, which is an Indian name. And um, so I am in, the, in a coastal city called Puerto Madryn. Uh, I am facing uh, the Atlantic Ocean, but the South Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and of course, I work on penguins and I live here because my neighbors are the penguins, you know, they, I can drive an hour, two hours and I, I, I get to see the first penguin colonies. And this is, this, those are one of the penguin colonies where, where I work. Um, so let me, let me uh, this is pretty interesting because I will try to, <laughs> with the help of Joe, I will try to change the computer because the video is working in the other computer. You know what, Pablo? I think we're in a perfect situation right now. So we've got your share screen on the other computer. If you want to go full screen, and then when you want to show us stuff, use the camera on the other one. I think we're. I think this will work perfectly right now. Ah, perfect. So you see me now. You see me there. We gotcha. <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. So I will try. Just a second. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Excellent. 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 So we're set. <laughs> so th this is like the a TV set because I have different cameras. So hello. Now that you see me, I can wave my hand. <laughs> um, and as I was telling you, uh, we are now finishing the summer because this is the southern hemisphere. Um, and um, I've been working on penguins for 30 years now. Um, I want to tell you a little bit with, uh, with some pictures. Uh, what do I do? How do I help penguins? What kind of research do I do? And also, what can we do uh, uh, to help penguins uh, de in independently of where, of where you, you live? So if we go to the first, uh, you can see the first um, slide now. Yep, just go full screen for us, Pablo, if you want to hit start presentation. Okay, let me see how to do this. Because you only see the small one, right? Yeah, we, we can kind of see the presenter view, but if you go, there we go, magic. Excellent, Excellent. So um, I've been working for 30 years, as I mentioned, but I always like to say that the, the first person that ever told me about something that was called a penguin was my grandmother. And my grandmother uh, used to, to visit penguins like a hundred years ago here in Patagonia. And when I was two or three years old, she used to tell me very nice stories about penguins. Uh, as you can see in the image, um, this is a very old image. And this was taken about 1920. 
And in those years, uh, it was a practice common here to hunt. They were to hunt lions, sea lions, elephant seals, and whales. Uh, so the ecotourism was not a common thing. But my grandmother had a, a, a special connection to wildlife. And, um, and she transmitted me that connection to, to penguins, particularly through the tales that she was telling me. So I grew, I grew up and then <clears throat> I really, I really got connected to them uh, uh, in the late eighties because where I live right now, about 40,000 penguins died per year due to oil spills. In this picture, this is me 30 years ago when I was rehabilitating penguins. Uh, there was a big oil spill here. We washed them, we fed them, and then we released them. And when I released the first one, I, I realized the impact that one action could have. So I said, if I can help one penguin and that penguin can breathe and come to the wild, um, I could do more things. I could scale up what I do and help many more penguins. So I decided to do that. And I went to the university to train myself and to have tools to help them. But the strong connection that I had and the experience that I had the first time I visited a penguin colony was a, a, a really like a, a, a special moment for me. Yeah, I felt that connection and I, I felt the, the need. I felt that working with penguins was going to be the mission of, of my life. And the good thing, the interesting thing about the penguins is that they are excellent indicators of what is happening in the ocean. I mean, when you study penguins, you can realize uh, what is happening in terms of food, in terms of pollution, in terms of everything. So when you study penguins, uh, you use penguins as ocean samplers. When you are in your colony, they come back and you realize immediately if there is a lack of food, if there is any problem out there. And it is important to say that there are 18 species of penguins in all, on all the planet. And over half of them, 55%, are considered endangered or vulnerable, as you can see in, in the slide. First of all, you can see the first five ones which are in danger, like the African penguin. Then we have five others that are vulnerable. Then we have three that are considered near threatened, like the emperor penguin, that the, which is the most famous penguin in all the planet. And then we have another five which are considered least concern, which it doesn't mean that the, there's no need to make conservation action for them. It means that compared to the other ones, they are in least emergency. So I was trained as a researcher in the university and you know, science is extremely important and is really necessary, but sometimes um, it is not sufficient. It's not enough. You have to make, get the science and do something with the science. So 10 years ago, I decided to create an organization uh, that is called GPS, Global Penguin Society, uh, which is a coalition that promotes the protection of all the penguin species through science and management of habitats and also ed education. So I want to show you a small clip that shows you how we work and, and what we do to help penguins. Did you know that more than half of the species of penguins are considered threatened? They spend most of their lives swimming hundreds, even thousands of miles per year. They live in diverse habitats, from the cold ice of Antarctica and the South Pole, to desert tropical coasts on the Galapagos Islands. Some of them even breed in the dense forests of New Zealand. Penguins are excellent indicators of the health and conditions of the oceans. They're warning us in their own language that the oceans are in trouble. Climate change, pollution, and the mismanagement of fisheries have a negative impact on them. Global Penguin Society promotes the conservation of all 18 species of penguins through science, management, and education. It assesses the conservation status of populations through scientific studies, works with governments to create protected areas, and educates communities so people will value conservation and maintain a healthy marine and coastal environment. 
you can be a part of saving these incredible creatures of the oceans they live in by supporting global penguin society. It's time to listen to the penguins and commit to their conservation and the protection of the world's oceans. So you can see some of the places where we work and we work with different species. Of course, I live here and the most common species of penguin here is the Magellanic penguin. And we're going to talk a little bit more about them. Uh, one interesting thing that I, I take home message for you is that penguins do not fly, you know? Uh, the penguins, they lost the ability to fly 60 e million years ago. Uh, the ancestor was used to be a flying bird, but Penguins, they improve the ability to dive in order to avoid competition for food with other animals. And that was a successful thing to do. That's why the, the group of penguins thrive in, in all in planet and we have 18 species, but they only live in the Southern hemisphere, including Australia, South America, South uh, Africa, and which is Australia and New Zealand, Oceania. The critical thing about conservation of penguins is that they are not only marine animals, they are also terrestrial animals. So they are facing threats in the ocean and also on land. And one of the typical things that we hear about the penguins is that they are affected by climate change. Most of us, we think that there are only three or four species of penguins and they love ice. But that is not the case. Uh, out of the 18 species, only four are linked to, to the Antarctic uh, um, environment. And the, but the rest of the penguins, they don't like the ice. They don't like cold temperatures. We even have a tropical penguin in Galapagos, in the Ecuador. So the problem with climate change is that climate change is changing the, the way the ice is melting, the pattern of, of formation and melting of ice in Antarctica. And that also affects the, 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 the quantity and the, the quality of the food uh, and the, the habitat the penguins need to, to feed and also to, to breed. But outside of Antarctica, climate change is also an issue because it is changing the distribution of food. And penguins need the food to be close to the colonies to go and get the food and feed their chicks. Uh, penguins cannot fly, so if the food is far away, they, uh, they cannot cover these distances quickly. They have to swim all the way. So it takes longer for them. And by the time they come back, sometimes the chicks are dead. But due to climate change, we are also having more storms, like the one you can see in the picture. Because penguins, when they are chicks, they're not waterproof. They don't have the waterproof feathers, so they cannot get wet. With these very big storms here, they get wet. Then uh, those storms come with cold wind and temperature. So they die because they lose their body temperatures. And uh, another thing related to penguins, uh, mainly in the past, uh, another problem was the oil, oil spills, oil pollution that killed thousands of penguins in, in four continents. Fortunately, that thing has been declining. Uh, the problem reduced the, the relevance, uh, the, the magnitude of the problem was reduced. But now, as you all know, we are having an issue in all the planet linked to plastic pollution. And, and penguins are not an exception. And we are finding penguins that are stuck with pieces of plastics, like the one that you can see in the picture. This penguin has a, a part of a plastic, a plastic bottle around the neck, and we find different things in all the colonies. So we are also working to avoid this, this issue. Uh, we also find penguins like this uh, juvenile that has pieces of a, a fishing net around the body. And uh, to give you an example of how we, we, we help them, and before I show you some of the gear I have here, um, one of the typical things that we do in science is, the, of course, we track colonies, but we also track the penguins to see where they are when they, we don't see them, when they are in the ocean. So we discover where are the feeding routes, where are the penguin highways in the oceans. So as you can see in the picture, we tag them. We, put devices on the back of these penguins. Sorry about that. You see the red tag there. So that is a, a satellite device. We, do, we use different kinds of technology, also GPS technology. And that allows us to know where penguins are online uh, 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 simultaneously. So 
one of the things we have got, for example, this is a typical penguin colony. And they, those colorful roots are the roots of each penguin that we track. So we know exactly where they are. And with that information, then we can meet with the government, with the landowners. We help them to create protected areas like this blue area. So we protect the area where penguins are eating, you know, and then we also protect the area where penguins breed on land because sometimes they are affected by human disturbance or many, many other issues. So we use the science to do conservation action and benefit penguins worldwide. So now this is the, let me see, stop share. And I want to show you uh, some things about the penguins, typical things about, about the penguins. You, you see me there? All right, I just spot that your screen, so you're nice and full screen, we see ya. Excellent, perfect, perfect. So this is a typical Magellanic penguin, you know, that we have. It is a medium-sized penguin. It is, oh, there we go. It is black, black and white, uh, as you can see. Uh, this is very typical to the penguin that you see in South Africa. It's another species, but this one only lives in South America. Um, so the, the great thing about the penguins when you study them is that they, they cannot escape because they don't fly. <laughs> so you get them on the nest. And to do that, we use like a hook and we get the, we get the, the penguins with the hook. We grab them from the, from the leg like, like this and they will take the penguin out of the nest very slowly. But you need somebody to work with you because these penguins can be very aggressive. They look very friendly and nice, but they learn how to defend themselves because they coexist with pumas, you know, cougars, with foxes, with ferrets, with different kinds of animals that are trying to kill them, eat them, or eat the eggs or the chicks. So they can be very aggressive. So when you work with penguins, you take the penguin out of the nest, somebody will have to grab the penguin by the neck, you know, like this. So you don't, you don't press, you just hold to control the head so it doesn't affect your colleague. And then you can work with the penguin uh, peacefully. One interesting thing about the penguins is that the, the wet, the, the wet, their weight changes a lot throughout the year because when they are in the winter, these penguins only uh, are here in Patagonia in the summer. They come here to breed. But in the winter, they spend six months out of the, in the ocean, migrating to Brazil. So when they are in the ocean in the winter, they eat a lot, eat a lot. So they, they gain a lot of weight in preparation for the, for the breeding season. Then they come here and they start feeding the chicks and breeding the chicks. They, they swim uh, a lot because they have to go get the food and come back. A penguin like this, they can dive, they can dive a swim. They can swim in one year, 10,000 miles, you know, which is incredibly a lot if you pay attention to the size of these guys. So when the penguins are taking care of the chicks, they lose a lot of weight. So we weight them. We weight them uh, many times during the, the breeding season. So I'm going to show you now how we weight them. So you see the penguin there, yes. You see there, yes, the penguin, yes. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Okay, so one of the things that we use, first of all, are the, these knee pads. <laughs> because when you work with penguins, you are all the time on your knees. So you have to protect your knees. <laughs> the, other, the other thing that we do when we weigh them, we use these kind of scales. Second. These are the scales that we use, you know, to weight the penguins. Like the, pen, the scales that you use when you when you are also fishing, you know. So what you have to do, you use like this kind of this piece, you know, like a you grab the penguin like this, you you put it around the body of the penguin. Of course, this penguin is stiff. Normally. The, the flippers will stay outside, you know, and then you just hang the penguin like this. It would work like this with a live penguin, you know, it would be hanging like this. And then you can determine the weight 
and you can determine if it is a good season, a bad season, because when they are not able to eat enough in the winter, they, they don't gain enough weight. So when, when they start the breeding season and they are thin, it means that they're not going to be able to raise their chicks successfully. Another thing that we do is that we measure the bill of the, of the, of the penguins because it's the only way to determine the sex of the penguin, if it is a male or a female. Let me put this sorry, uh, closer to the camera so you can see it better. So we use these calipers because to determine the, the, the sex, if it's a male or a female, we use the size of the bill. You know, normally the males have longer and wider bills. So we measure them like this and also like this. And that helps us to determine if it is a, a female or a male, you see? So we measure this part, this part of the bill and also the length like this, like this, you know? And another interesting thing about the penguins is that of course, they are all the time eating fish, and they are also they also drink seawater. And you know that salt can be a, a bad thing for their bodies, for their organisms. So they they have in this area, around the around the, their eyes, they have a, a salt salt glands, which are a parts a, which are glands that help them to eliminate the excess of salt from their body. So when you are walking in a penguin colony, many times you, you listen to them sneezing, you know, like they go <laughs> sneezing like somebody with a cold. And that's the way they eliminate the excess of, of salt through droplets that fall out of the, of the tip of, of their bills. Another thing that we do is that penguins, they all look the same. So when you work with penguins, Sometimes you need really need to identify them. Uh, you need to follow them and, and identify. So the only way to identify penguins is when you band them, you know, and we use this kind of, I don't know if you can see there, there. These are stainless steel bands with a, with a number, specific number. It's like a passport more or less. So we put them on the left flipper of them and we follow them during all their lives. Sometimes we find penguins that are 32, 33 years old. And, um, and they, sometimes they move out of their colonies. Uh, sometimes they, they do different things. So we can do a lot of scientific studies because uh, thanks to these banding mechanisms. So far uh, in these populations, uh, about 60,000 birds have been banded for for 30 years. Of course, many of those are, are dead already, but a lot of information was possible to, to gather, to collect thanks to this banding uh, uh, system. And then as I show you in the picture, uh, we put devices on the back of them. And uh, as you know, all the body of the penguin is covered by feathers. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things uh, is, is that is difficult to do is to deploy, you know, to, to stick the, the devices on, on their body. Uh, but we use the feathers. We put the devices here in this part of the body. And we use different layers of feathers. We put, we put tapes, you know, uh, and then we put the device there and we stick the device to the body with those tapes attached to the feathers. So the, the, the interesting thing is like, sometimes we use satellite devices and the, the satellite devices are very expensive between two and $3,000 each. So you want to get the device back because you can recycle the batteries and use it again. Um, uh, so you really need to put the device in a trustable bird. The good thing about penguins is that they're very loyal to their territories. So you put a device on, a, on, on penguins that we call VIPs, which are very important penguins. That, those are the penguins that we've been following for a long time, and we know that they, they come to the same nest. So therefore, we can recover the device. And in some of the cases, we, we've been trying other technology like these little you know, devices 
The device is very small because now with the GPS technology, we can put the devices are much uh, cheaper, so we can put more devices. Hmm? This one does not have the device on it, but the device would come here. It's like a little candy, very small device. And we put this on, on, on their foot as well. Hmm? Uh, the, 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 the bad thing about GPS technology is that you really need to recover the device to get the information. If you don't recover the bird, if you don't recover the device, you lose the information. With the satellite technology, if you don't recover the bird or you don't recover the device, you still have the information. Uh, the good thing about the ocean <laughs> is that it guess that you put the device and you never find the animal back the seawater, the salt water will dilute the, the glue and it will fall, it will make the penguin lose the device. So the penguin will not have to carry the device any longer. We will lose the device, but that is fine, you know? And um, so, and these are the, the pliers that we use to, to put the, these rings. These are the pliers that we use to put the the rings on, on the penguins. These are pliers that are specifically uh, designed, you know, let me show them, specifically designed for this kind of penguins, for this kind of, uh, of, of rings, of, of bands. Mm -hmm. So, and finally, what I want to show you, I brought, are you, can you hear me well? Yeah, you're still coming through well, Pablo. Perfect, perfect. So one of the things that I have here is this skeleton, you know, of a penguin, you know? I love this skeleton. It doesn't have a name. <laughs> so the, the interesting thing about the penguins is that uh, they have a lot of adaptations to, to, to dive, you know? Uh, you, as you know, most of the birds, they, they need to be light. They don't need to be, they cannot be, um, heavy because they need to fly. But that's not the case for the penguins. So most of the birds, they have what we call pneumatic bones, bones that are empty inside with a lot of air because <clears throat> that avoids them a lot of, 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 of weight. You know, that reduces their weight. In the case, in, that is not the case of the penguins because penguins, they don't need to fly, but they need to die. So their bones are heavy. The long bones are heavy. So uh, the interesting thing about the penguins is that everybody likes penguins because they waddle, right? They, they, it's funny the way they walk. And it looks as if they don't have a knee. But in fact, they do. Because the, the things that we don't see, we don't see their knees. But if you pay attention to their, let me see there maybe, you see the complete leg, you know, everything. So they walk just like any other animal, just like us. The thing is that due to their body shape, you know, all these parts are covered and you don't see their knees. And that is, that is what makes them walk in this funny, funny way. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course they have many other adaptations because for example, uh, an emperor penguin, they can dive down to half a kilometer, you know, 500 meters under the ocean. So they have a lot of adaptations to survive there with the high pressure that, that, that they have. And, um, and of course, here you can clearly see the adaptation, let me show you. Because of course, the ancestor, as I told you, used to be a flying bird. And here you can see, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can see it clearly here, but yep. these are, okay, these are the bones of what used to be a, a wing. Now it's a flipper is very well adapted to propel themselves. Hmm? And while you look at this, I'm going to open this shelf because I want to show you something very special that I think here. And this is, I want to show you this. This is the egg of a, of a king penguin. Hmm? You know, the king penguins, they live in the, of course, here in the, in the south of South America or in the South Indian Ocean as well. It is a big, look at the size of my hand. Hmm? Maybe like this is better, like this. 
it's a it's a it's a big egg and the eggshell is really thick it's really thick and one important thing with the penguins is that uh, most of the penguins they lay one or two eggs mm -hmm. uh, and there is a difference between three or four days among the day uh, between the between the laying egg of those eggs but the problem is that the the chicks when they are uh, when they hatch they compete for food. So there shouldn't be a big difference in size between the chicks. So what do the parents do? So the parents, they don't start incubating the eggs until both eggs are laid. Because the eggs, they start to develop when the temperature is above 25 degrees Celsius, you know? So what do they do? So the female lays the first egg, but the parents don't incubate. Once the second egg is incubated, it is laid, then both parents start to incubate. So the chicks, they develop at the same time. And then the, in, in general, there is a difference of two days between the, the hatching day of, of both chicks. So by the time the chicks hatch, they have approximately the same size so they can compete for food in the same way. And um, but it is very interesting to see that these eggshells are really, really thick mm? because sometimes there are fights among penguins and of course the eggs have to be prepared to, to survive those fights or, or those circumstances. So this is pretty much it. I only wanted to show you a last thing that I love. And you know that for, for a long time in history, People thought the navigators and explorers, I mean, I'm talking about five, four uh, centuries ago, they were navigating and they were seeing penguins in the ocean, but they could see that they were very graceful in the water, that they could really fly under the water and that they were like marine birds, marine animals. So that they thought that uh, penguins were kind of fish. So I bought this in London this is a, an, an original, a genuine uh, antique engraving from, it, it has over 200 years. And the interesting thing about, I don't know if you can see it, let me see, is that when they painted this penguin, they painted scales like fish. They didn't paint feathers. You see that in their belly, in the neck. So, and that shows clearly that they thought that penguins were related to fish and not to birds. Mm -hmm. I love, this is my very special, <laughs> my very special uh, painting that I have here where, where, where I work, but, and I wanted to, to, to share this with you because I love this engraving. Mm -hmm. All right, very cool. Well, Pablo, thank you so much for sharing everything with us today. I know our original plan was to try to be out uh, in the colony, but when the winds are like 40 miles per hour, that's not a good time to be out. <laughs> Uh, in a penguin colony. All right. Well, Pablo, how about we get some questions from our classrooms? Excellent. Perfect. Well, I just want to give a shout out to our YouTube classes. You can use the chat sidebar on the right to send us in some questions. I'll give a shout out to Mrs. Catuso's group in Arlington Heights, Illinois. Thanks for joining in with us. Send us in a question. But for now, let's meet uh, some of our live classrooms. So I'm going to start. Let's see. Let's go to Mrs. Peterson. They're joining us in Idaho. Looks like some fifth graders. Let's get that microphone on. How are we doing, Idaho? We're good. Good morning. What subjects in school did you study to help you become a scientist? I, I lost the, the first part of the question, excuse me. Oh, uh, she was wondering, what did you study in school to become a scientist? Uh, OK, subjects? excellent. Thank you. Uh, so I studied uh, biology uh, here in, in Patagonia, in Argentina. Uh, first of all, the system here in Argentina is different compared to the United States or other countries in Europe. Uh, so after high school, I went for five other years to the university and, and then I became a biology and then I did a, I did a PhD on marine biology. Uh, but that is because I, I love biology, I like biology. Um, but the, uh, if you want, because this is important to say, there are many, many roles, in, there are many ways the, 
to help to work, to work in conservation. You don't necessarily need to be a scientist. You can, you can be a scientist if you like that, but you can be whatever you want to do and you can still have a, a role in conservation. Uh, and that is very important when you talk to your parents because sometimes your parent can be a lawyer or work in a supermarket, but we, we can all do something special for conservation. It does, uh, so you don't need to be a biologist, but you, if you want to, uh, follow a career in biology and mm, you know if you are curious about the natural world that is fantastic uh, I did biology but I realized now uh, that it is also very important to learn how to work with people uh, in many cases the problems that the pen the animals are facing are linked to people so if you study something about social psychology or psychology in general or you know, things about social aspects of people that can also have a big impact on, on conservation. All right, great question to get us started. I wanna give a shout out to Mrs. Rambaran's class joining us in Canada, in Ontario. they are five sixes, but their microphone is not cooperating today. So give me a big wave at the camera so we can see you guys. There they are. Let's just test the microphone one more time. Uh, no dice. So Mr. Rambaran, if you want to send their question in via the chat, we'll make sure that we work it in. But for now, I'm going to jump to Mrs. DeCourcy's group. They are in Illinois. It looks like some fourth graders hanging out with us. How are we doing, fourth graders? Good. 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 All right. What's your question, baby girl? Do, when penguins grow their, when penguins are growing their waterproof feathers, do their parents feed them or do they go without food? Great. So uh, the, when, they, when the chicks hatch, they, they have a down feather, which is not waterproof. And the chicks, they stay for two months, more or less, uh, in their nests, and they cannot go to the ocean because they're not waterproof. But when they are two months old, more or less, they, they start to change all the feathers. They lose all the down feather, and they get the new plumage, the new feathers, and those feathers are waterproof. By that time, when they are two months old, they are kind of abandoned by, the, by their adults because by that time, the chicks are big and they can go on their own to look for food in the ocean. So they become waterproof by the age of two months, two months and a half. All right, awesome question. Let's take a little trip now to Ms. McGinnis's group in Maine uh, in the US. Looks like some more fourth graders hanging out with us this morning. How are we doing, fourth graders? Good. Um, hi, my name is Colbeck, and um, what is your favorite penguin? Why? What is my favorite species of penguin? Mm -hmm. And why? Okay, and why? Okay, why? thank you. So I have to say I love them all, <laughs> so they're not jealous, uh, but. Um, I always, I don't know why, but I, I always love one species that is called the yellow-eyed penguin. And they only live in, in New Zealand. There are 1,700 pairs left in the planet, that's all. And they're very shy and they're very strange for me because when they are chicks, the eyes are really bluish. And when then when they get uh, when they grow older, the eyes become yellow, completely yellow. Uh, they are big guys, kind of robust, uh, and I like them, you know, I like them. I also like, um, you know, the ones that have these crested, these crests, colorful crests around the, 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 the eyes, and those, those crested penguins, uh, in general, they have red eyes. Uh, I love crested animals, uh, crested birds, uh, crested penguins as well. All right, good question. I was lucky enough a few years ago when I visited New, Zeal New Zealand to see some of those yellow-eyed penguins, which was pretty amazing. cool. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's very hard to see them because they're very few and shy, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Consider myself pretty lucky then. Yes, you are, definitely. <laughs> All right, taking another trip to Canada. Some grade four or fives hanging out with Mrs. Henstridge. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, boys and girls? How 
penguins hold their breath? I couldn't follow that one. It was too too low, the sound. You want to try a little bit louder? How long can penguins hold their breath? Oh, excellent. Excellent question. For how long a penguin yeah. can hold their breath? So amazing question, <laughs> because uh, that is linked to what we were talking about, the adaptations, you know, because of course, when they kind of decided to start conquering the ocean and diving, uh, it was not an easy thing. So the record is um, from the emperor penguins. Uh, emperor penguins are the ones that live in Antarctica. You know, happy feet, the march of the penguins, those are emperor penguins. Um, they can hold their breath for 23 minutes. So they can be under the water without breathing for 23 minutes, which is amazing because human beings, if you are a trained human being, you can hold your breath, if you are lucky, for four minutes. So they do it for 23 minutes. That is, and that is how they can be under the water for so long and they can dive half a kilometer under the surface. Uh, wow. Unbelievable. <laughs> All right, pretty awesome. So I've got a great question here from um, our class, Ms. Rombaran's class, and they're wondering if penguins went extinct, how would that affect our ecosystem? How would that affect the ecosystem? Absolutely. So the interesting thing to, to, to consider is that the environment, there are many species and the species, they interact, all the species interact. They are, they eat other animals or plants uh, and they also help other plants or animals to, 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 to breed, to reproduce, to spread out and to thrive but they are also eaten by other animals. So they have a special role um, to play. Uh, penguins, uh, depending on the species or depending on the area, they play a very special role uh, in, in many different ways. So if a penguin disappears, for example, uh, they're, they're, some other animals are eating penguins. So there would be a lack of food, for example. Uh, penguins are also very, very important because when they go into the ocean, they eat. And then when they come back to their nest and you know they defecate in the colonies, they, they bring a lot of nutrients into the, in, on, on the land. And there are many different examples of, uh, of the impact that the, um, a loss of a penguin species could have. All right, let's take another little trip here. This time we're gonna go to New York. Got some fifth graders hanging out with Mrs. O'Gorman. Let me get that microphone turned on. There they are. How are we doing, fifth graders? Uh, <laughs> okay, Chris. Um, does it take courage to go and study the penguins? Does it take, sorry? <laughs> really? It's okay. He's wondering if it takes courage to study the penguins. Ah, uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, um, you have to love to work in the wild, uh, but I love, I love my work because there's, there's a lot of expedition. There's a lot of adventure. Uh, you go to places that you can't believe your eyes. Um, you have to, in, in many cases, you have to navigate a lot. So if you like to navigate, of course, once in a while, you can have some rough seas, but now with the weather forecast, you can predict that uh, and avoid uh, rough seas. Um, but uh, penguins are very, I think uh, they're easy animals to work with compared to other animals. Uh, sometimes I see that also when film crews come here, uh, sometimes film crews, they have to spend, I don't know, in other, if they're working with other animals like, you know, tigers or other animals, they have to spend days waiting for a for a moment so they can film the animal in case of penguins you know you can you can visit colonies that are uh, visited by people uh, and penguins they don't even pay attention to you because when the colonies that are open for tourists to come if they are well managed and they respect the penguins the penguins get habituated they get used to see people and they feel respected so they don't feel that human beings are a threat. So you come to those colonies and they're taking a nap. The penguins are sleeping. 
you walk by them and they, they don't even wake up. So penguins, uh, if they kind of, they're used to people, they're uh, kind of good animals to work with. Of course, they don't like to be touched as I explained before. So you can, when you visit them, you're not allowed to touch them. But when we do research, we have to be very careful because the way I explained, uh, you have somebody has to hold the penguin so it doesn't hurt other other uh, it doesn't hurt your colleague. Um, but uh, I don't think it's a dangerous work, um, and I didn't have throughout my life as a biologist I didn't have many dangerous situations. Maybe like 30 years ago when we didn't have weather forecast, you couldn't predict the weather. But now that that the weather is predicted pretty well. So I think you have to follow your heart. You I think you have to follow what you love, you know? Uh, and the rest, you don't care about the rest. <laughs> All right, awesome advice. And we're gonna visit our last classroom. They're joining us in Ontario here in Canada. Looks like some fourth and sixth graders with Mrs. Lenny. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing Ontario? Um, do the trackers you put on the penguins disturb them? Sorry, can, can you repeat that one, please? Um, do the trackers you put on the penguins disturb them or like, can they feel them? Uh, perfect. So the way I explain it, we, when we put the, the satellite devices or the GPS devices, uh, the technology is fantastic right now because we've been trying to develop new, new ways to minimize the impact that we have on the penguins. So the way we, we deploy these, these devices, um, they are done in a way that we don't stick them to the, to the skin, just to the feathers. And, and then that doesn't hurt the penguin at all. And then if we don't recover the device, as I explained, the device will, will be lost in the ocean. Uh, so it's not that the penguin will have to carry the device all, all, all his life. And, um, and again, of course, we all the shapes and the, 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 the shape and the design of the devices tries to minimize uh, the drag. So it doesn't interfere with the way they, they swim and they, they dive. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Pablo, I think we can steal one question off YouTube and I think it's a good one to end off on. And this group is wondering about what students can do. What can students do in their classrooms, in their communities, even though they might be far away from penguins, how, what, what can they do to make a difference? Excellent. So one of the things that uh, is typical for all the species that they cannot speak, they cannot, you know, they cannot go on TV, they cannot write, they cannot say what's wrong, what do they need, but we can give voice to them. So maybe it's a penguin, maybe it's a lion, maybe it's a bird or a worm. I mean, it could be any, it could be an environment that you really care about. We are all connected to different things. We all have different kinds of motivations. We all like different things. So, but if you like penguins, for example, uh, you don't need to live in, in here. You don't need to live among penguins to protect them and help them. All the planet is connected in, through, the, through the air and also through the oceans. So whatever you do in your house, whatever you do in your daily lives can have an impact on penguins, on oceans and on the entire environment. Right now, a thing that you can do immediately is avoid single-use plastics. Every day we use so many things we don't need uh, that are made on plastics. And you can go home and tell your mother, tell your father to stop buying that things that we don't need. No more straws and uh, no more th things that are made on plastic that you only use once. That can have a very big impact, not only on penguins, and, but on oceans and the entire environment. So there's a great mission that, that you can accomplish. And also convince and tell this to your friends, to your, to your parents, do something in your school and always try to recycle as much as you can. Do not waste any kind of energy. Do not waste food or, or light or electricity or water. Uh, that is a great way to help the planet. All right. Awesome advice to leave uh, off on today. Uh, Pablo, before we sign off, I want to go to Mrs. Hensridge class really quick. I can see someone holding up a pillow I think you'll like. So Mrs. Hensridge, Clyde, you want to hold that pillow up?
say something for us so that it pops onto your screen. Hi, that's Hi. my friend Matt. He's got a penguin pillow. Yeah, there that's we go. Me. Amazing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> All right, I thought you'd like that. Well, classrooms, classrooms who joined us on YouTube today, classrooms who joined us on camera, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for uh, those awesome questions. And Pablo, thank you so much for being flexible. I know the weather didn't cooperate with us today, but uh, we made it work. Thanks for having an awesome backup plan and showing us all the amazing gear and your passion uh, for protecting penguins. No, thank you so much. And I'm always willing to, to share what we do to help penguins and help the planet. Thank you. All right, the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the microphones on. Classrooms nice and loud. A huge Please. goodbye and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, classrooms, that was awesome. Pablo, again, a huge thank you. Looking forward to our next event together. Looking forward to seeing your classrooms again in another National Geographic Explorer classroom. Thanks everyone for hanging out today. Thank you, bye.